everyone, we're back for the next episode of 23rd Mind TV. It's been a while, but it's been kind of a hectic summer, as we all know. (laughs) Just first, if you're listening to this on the Rendering Unconscious podcast stream, please know there is a video for this, and we're going to be showing videos and art and books. So you're going to want to go over to the Trapart Film YouTube channel. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T Films YouTube channel for 23rd Mind TV. That's right. And again, you know, welcome. And thank you for uh, uh, supporting us uh, during these actually three months since the latest uh, episode. We have been very, very busy. And uh, as you know by now, the main social media hub and the hub for us is our uh, Patreon. And we would like to express our gratitude and thanks to uh, our uh, patrons uh, who are, uh, by their support, making uh, projects like this possible. So thank you for that. And of course, also thank you to all of you um, cottage industry people and artists who've been sending in stuff, sending stuff to us to talk about. That's very good and we are doing uh, our best to uh, keep up with the stuff that we're receiving and we will make um, you know a uh, real effort to mention as much as possible all these things. So that will be the second half of this uh, show will be sort of uh, what do you call it? Uh, cherry cropping or something like that. picking the best stuff of the stuff that's coming in uh, during these three months since the most recent episode uh, again thank you very much for for supporting this project and this show yeah so uh, we have been very i would dare to say you know unusually busy <laughs> <laughs> because uh, we're not going anywhere we're staying put and uh, seeing the world fly by and we are um, just uh, doing a lot of projects uh, individually and also together we'll talk about all these things Uh, but I guess the most important thing for me uh, has been the completion and the publication the publishing of the Fenris Wolf issue number 10 which we have right here so I'll be a proud uh, editor and publisher and just uh, hold it like this, uh, Fenris Wolf number 10. I think most of you know uh, the story of the Fenris Wolf and how I began it as an occultural fanzine already back in 1989. It grew and grew into a little book and then it took a long hiatus, actually of 18 years. But from 2011 and on, it's been almost an annual uh, project and they've just like grown and grown and grown. And I'm very proud of this because it doesn't only signify a 30-year publishing cycle, uh, publishing The Fenris Wolf as an um, occultural anthology of really cool stuff, but it's also number 10. So that's a good you know, anniversary thing. And um, as usual, it contains a very eclectic mix of things um, because that's what The Fenris Wolf is, is an eclectic anthology of thought-provoking, intelligent stuff, of different magics, uh, uh, old, new, uh, and perhaps also the magics of the future. We shall see. And I mean, it's just just goes on and on here with interesting stuff. Uh, Let me just mention a few things from the most recent issue. Um, It's about magical anthropology, of course. Uh, sexual magic, erotopsychedelic art, Friedrich Nietzsche's use of psychoactive drugs, uh, the occult meaning of the Fenris wolf, uh, dreaming, mytho-historical traces within photography, um, uh, magic and influence of African art, um, disease as a magical incentive, uh, Taoism, Buddhism and machine consciousness, mimetic entities, mimetic magic, the transformative power of causative thinking, etc, etc, etc. There's Gary Lachman being interviewed about this relationship with Colin Will- Wilson, uh, Hellboy, the comics and its relation to Lovecraft. Uh, Benjamin Christensen's great film Witchcraft Through the Ages, like the complete story of that film, how it happened, and also a full story about how LaVey's The Satanic Bible uh, happened, how it was constructed and put together. 
and lots more uh, the art of John Pope, the art of Genesis Peorage, and just like you know, an endless array of good stuff. So, Fenris Wolf number 10 is out now via Amazon and, and uh, other online booksellers, uh, and you should simply get a copy because it's uh, a labor of love, but it's also a uh, celebration 30 year publishing cycle. Uh, number 10 and it really makes me happy because there are so many things uh, up ahead in terms of Fenris so yeah that's a good one yeah and the last piece in this Fenris Wolf number 10 is a review by Claire Madeleine Corso of our conference the Psychoanalysis Art and the Occult Conference from 2016 and the collected papers from that conference are actually Fenris Wolf number nine, yeah. which you can get through the Trapar store yeah. because Trapar is having a huge sale right now yeah. where so many of the books are like $10. Yeah. So head over there and grab some books from Trapar while you're at it. Absolutely. And when we're on my favorite topic, Fenris Wolf, uh, we could also talk about uh, this one that just came out and that's Fenris Wolf number four uh, a republication and the thing is that um, many of these earlier issues this is number four it originally came out in 2011 since then you know sold out quickly uh, it's been fetching really insane prices at eBay and, and many other places and although it's very honoring uh, as a publisher and editor uh, I would like for it to be available for uh, everybody. So I don't know if that's what's called the democratic process. I don't know. But anyway, uh, I'm going to make all of the sold out earlier issues of the Fenris Wolf available again. And this is the most recent one, Fenris 4. The other ones will follow suit uh, on a more or less regular basis. But I mean, this is also just um, a darling. It's filled with uh, occulture. It's filled with uh, magical anthropology, different kinds of magics. It's just, uh, I don't know, I call it a smorgasbord of uh, occultural delightment. And I don't take that lightly. It really is a lot to chew on and it's all very, very uh, nutritious. Yeah. Yeah, and it's been really fun to reread these Fenrises yeah. um, as they've been coming out. I've been loving it. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, uh, when I wrote the introduction for uh, number 10, uh, I was just sort of, uh, how many pages are there in these first first nine issues? And it's like 2,700 pages of uh, stuff. And again, I don't say that lightly. It's stuff that's meant to titillate, inspire, inform, uh, provoke, uh, and everything that uh, is good for the human being in her development and in her individuation process i believe in an eclectic approach otherwise it becomes too i don't know fundamentalist it becomes too dogmatic and that's not what the fenris wolf is about it's about being open and open-minded yeah. and there's really nothing else like it no uh, i haven't i've looked i haven't found it <laughs> so it's uh, it's a good thing and uh, the feedback that we're getting from number 10 is fantastic and and it's just um it's not unexpected, but it makes me very happy. It makes us very happy to hear that uh, people are getting the 10th issue and that they're actually yeah, loving it. Right. And then uh, we've also carried on in this sort of backtracking in terms of the books. And I think this little darling uh, is no more than worth mentioning. It's a gem. It's a paperback uh, version of, of Vanessa's book, uh, switching mirrors uh, that came out originally late 2016 as a hardbound book and also a special edition with a print that's still available at the Trapar website but we wanted to make this one also available in an inexpensive um, you know people's edition if you will and it's just great why don't you um, talk a little bit about that yeah so these are basically cut up poems that I created from 2015 and 2016 um, and they are all pieces made from mostly different people I know, artists that I like, authors that I enjoy um, and then of course there's some Freud and Lacan thrown in and Jung 
Um, but there's pieces um, created from Carl's writing, my friend Caitlin Foisey's writing, Genesis and Lady J's words, uh, Charlotte Rogers, Alkistis and Peter from Scarlet Imprint, Val Denham, lots of really magical creative individuals. And I mentioned this because what everyone seems to tell me is that this is a great little book for bibliomancy. So, of course, it's poetry, so it's not meant to be read from cover to cover, but of course you can. But what people have been telling me over the years is that it's a great little book to kind of pick up and then just flip to a page and read a poem and see what it says and see how that has meaning for you at that moment in time. And I think the reason that it was so great for that is because um, because all the words in here are from really magical creative individuals so I feel like it's extra potent and jam-packed that way and then of course Burroughs and Geisen's words are also in here and one thing that Burroughs said all the time which I really loved was if you have an author that you really enjoy, you can cut up that author's writing and rearrange it in a new way, and you still have that author speaking, but they're saying something new or different. And I really believe that, and I've seen that happen through the cut-up process, and it's made me look at writing and text and words in a whole new way. Um, and then, of course, on the other end of that spectrum is that you know, all writing is cut-ups, as Burroughs also said, and none of us actually own any of these words because these words have all existed before us. We just keep putting them together in new ways and rearranging it. So it's very intimate on one hand and, like, personal, but also very, like, also for the people. There's no author, you know, um, at the same time. So I really love that, and I love that concept, and... To me, that goes along with the unconscious and the way it works as well. Um, yeah, so I love cut-ups, and this is the my favorite way to make art. Lately, since this book, I've been doing more of these kinds of collage pieces where I integrate the cut-up words into the collages, and then I've been transcribing and reading aloud, aloud the, the words from my collages, whereas before, most of the poems that are in this book in particular are more just text-based. I wasn't working so much with collage as just making text-based um, poems. So the new book that I have told our Patreons about, but I haven't told anyone else about yet that I've been working on, putting this together has inspired me to make a second book of cut-up poetry, which I'm now working on. And basically that's what I'm doing. Um, when I make collages, usually in the morning, I write down my dreams and then make a collage and a cut-up afterwards and see how the dreams and the collage and the cut-up kind of reflect one another. Then I read the cut-ups out loud um, and record myself reading them. So I've basically been transcribing all of these cut-up poems that I've been reading over these past couple of years um, and making a new cut-up book that will be out um, pretty soon, either at the end of this year or early next year. We shall see. And I just have to take this moment to thank Damien Patrick Williams for introducing us to this Otter software because that's what I'm using to transcribe this book. And it's just changed our lives. We love it so much. So thank you, Damien. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, Damien is also in the Fenris Wolf Volume yeah. 10. And his work is also in Rendering Unconscious, the book. And I've interviewed him twice for the Rendering Unconscious podcast. So I will link to all of that as well. Because you should really check out Damien's work. Um, his website is called A Future Worth Thinking About. Which is perfect. Yeah. No, he's a, a bright mind for sure. And on that note of rearranging when uh, you're working on, on uh, textual cut-ups, uh, we have also, as most of you know, uh, initiated that into a kind of working method on, on, on uh, slightly bigger projects. And Switching Mirrors, of course, uh, has been one of those projects. I mean, uh, the texts have been put to music, uh, that have been put to film, uh, that have been put to uh, the actual collages and art exhibitions and stuff like that. It's just um, the way we work, basically. You take something and you refine it and you refine it and you refine it and move it from one uh, creative expression to another and see what comes up along the way. It's like a never-ending process. 
So I was thinking on that note of talking about Switching Mirrors, uh, both the albums, Switching and Mirrors, we had so many, so we had to make two albums, uh, are available uh, at our band camp, for instance. And also there are many, many videos. I was thinking we should have a look at one of the videos from Switching Mirrors. I've created all of these uh, videos from poems that we actually recited while we were in Portugal. We took a trip together to Portugal in the end of 2016 as we were putting the book together. Um, and I read poems from the book in different various sites around Portugal. Um, and so that one was one of the poems that was recorded in Portugal that I then created this video to. Right. You have also uh, been uh, extremely active on the circuit. And you, of course, ask, what circuit is that? And it's the podcast circuit uh, with uh, your own Rendering Unconscious podcast. And, and I'm sure you have a lot of stuff to, to uh, tell us about that. Yes. This summer, I have done so many Rendering Unconscious podcast episodes. Um, Rendering Unconscious did turn 100, so we've hit 100 episodes, and now I think I'm on 114, um, and I just recorded one yesterday, so that'll be 115, I believe. <coughs> so I've been very busy this summer. I probably had like two, on average, podcasts a week I've done. Some weeks I've talked to three people, some weeks only one. I'm trying to slow down a little now because... Um, it's been a lot to keep up with and I also want to make sure that I get together all the videos 
of the conversations from previous podcasts um, and get them all up on YouTube as well because people have been telling me that they've really enjoyed watching our conversation when possible. Um, and also, of course, YouTube also provides a transcription so that people can read the discussion um, if they'd like instead of uh, listening to it. And of course, that's really important to have available. So um, I'm also going to be working on the backlog from that, of which there are about 50 episodes for me to get up. So <laughs> I have a little bit of work cut out for me, um, but I'm happy to do it. And I also want to put up more recordings from our conferences. Um, we have recorded talks from both of our conferences, the Psychoanalysis, Art, and the Occult, and the Rewriting the Future, 100 Years of Esoteric Modernism and Psychoanalysis. So I'm working on getting all of those backlogs up. Um, there's so many to mention from the summer, and I wouldn't want to prioritize anyone over anyone else. So I will just direct you to the Rendering Unconscious website or, and you can listen to the podcast anywhere you enjoy listening to podcasts it's on all of the different platforms um, the two most recent ones were with Hilda Fernandez Alvarez who started Lacan Salon in Vancouver Canada she's really fantastic clinician and then the one before that was with Dr. Leon Brenner who's out of Berlin and he just had a book come out <coughs> in the Paul Grave Lacan series on autism, on the autistic subject at the threshold of language. And I must say the podcast is doing really well. Um, where I used to get about a hundred listens, you know, when I first post them, now we're getting four, four or five hundred listens in the first week of posting an episode. So I'm really happy that people are enjoying listening to talks about psychoanalysis. That was my goal when I started the podcast and I really just wanted to get psychoanalysis analysis and psychoanalytic thinking out to more broad audience um, and it looks like that's happening so that's really great and then on the flip side of that I've been interviewed for a couple of different podcasts as well um, earlier this summer I was interviewed by Dr. Robert Bashara for his comedic means of production podcast so I'll put a link to that He's fantastic. He's mm -hmm. also a psychoanalytic thinker, a critical psychologist, a professor, and also an artist and filmmaker in his own right. So definitely follow his work. I'll link to that. And then I was on Projections podcast with Mary Wilde and Sarah Cleaver, and we talked about psychoanalysis, the occult, and the film Hereditary by Ari Aster. So that was really fun. Those ladies are fabulous. If you're not following them already, you really, really should. Um, I'll link to their social media. And Mary Wilde in particular does a series uh, called Projections through the Freud Museum. Just this past week, she did a class on Darren Aronofsky's films, which is fantastic. And she's done classes on Lars von Trier and a host of other directors, David Lynch, etc. And a lot of her classes are online and available at the Freud Museum website where you can watch them even though they've already happened. They've been recorded. And watching these kinds of classes through the Freud Museum is helping the Freud Museum stay uh, afloat during this time of pandemic because they had to close, of course, for the whole summer. They're open now partially, but you know who knows what's going to happen in the future. So I've been really enjoying um, downloading and listening to these classes through the Freud Museum website, and I highly recommend that for anyone who's interested in psychoanalysis. And then one other podcast that I was on, which is actually a TV show in the Washington, D.C. area, um, was with Dr. Katherine Marshall Woods, who I also had as a guest earlier this summer on rendering. But she hosts this TV show called A Healthy Mind, and she had me on to talk about psychoanalysis and what psychoanalysis is and the difference between you know, psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, what, what you might find when you see a psychoanalyst versus a psychotherapist or a psychoanalytically inclined clinician, even if it's not psychoanalysis proper. Um, so yeah, so definitely check those out. I'll link to all of those. Um, they've all been great discussions with really fantastic people. Yeah. And also you've been active 
in that same what we call colorful gray area between the psychoanalysis and art in the sense that uh, earlier on i think we talked about this in an earlier episode uh, you put together a book called scansion uh, and uh, that book is uh, coming out very soon i mean this it's now end of october and in another month or so it'll be out actually yeah november 17th it will be released through rutledge it's called Scansion in Psychoanalysis and Art, The Cut and Creation. And that's also one of the reasons why we haven't been here for 23rd Mind TV is because we've been wrapping up all of these books. So I was doing final edits for this book over the summer in July and August, which kept me really busy. Um, and then, of course, Carl was wrapping up the Fenris Wolf Volume 10 and a couple of other projects, what he will tell you about in a minute. Um, yeah, so we've been really busy wrapping up books mainly, which, mm -hmm. of course, as everyone knows, is really time-consuming, but fun. It's the most time-consuming and the most fun, <laughs> I would like to add. No, but Scansion is an uh, amazing book, and I look forward to reading it like in a, in a real book, book shape, book form, uh, because it talks about um, the history of, um, say, for instance, uh, 20th century art, specifically also some 19th century developments in photography, and how that was, uh, has been, and is still is, very tightly connected, um, to how we look at our minds, and how that affected culture, and psychoanalysis has been such a key force, a key agent in um, opening up people's way of thinking. And that has also reflected in the development of cultural technology and vice versa. So it's like a hand-in-hand -hand scenario, which is um, really fascinating to read about. So great work, Vanessa. I look forward to reading the book. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And I specifically focused on Scansion, which is a Lacanian psychoanalytic technique and concept, which is about the cut. It's about um, cutting the end of the session um, Lacan said if you cut the end of the session instead of at a certain amount of time ending but rather when the analysand um, unconscious is open when somebody has a slip or um, something that they say that seems especially poignant or loaded uh, the analyst will stop on that word or that moment where this we have that kind of aha feeling where everything seems to be coming together or making sense or kind of falling apart is the other side of it um, where things are making meaning or kind of the meaning that you thought was there all of a sudden sort of slips away and you're left kind of somewhere else. Um, so I'm sure we've all had that kind of experience and Lacan thought that that was really the crux of psychoanalysis and the psychoanalytic practice. Um, not this kind of idea where you're like telling your story and fitting together all the pieces into a nice tidy narrative. More it was about like breaking down narratives that you've kind of told yourself over time and asking new questions and opening up like new pathways and new ideas um, rather than kind of closing down thought into like a rigid structure. So I realized when I was studying Lacan that a lot of artists that I enjoy kind of do this with their work as well. They're not thinking of it necessarily as a Lacanian technique, but they are just doing it because that's what people do. So they're either cutting themselves, cutting their bodies, cutting the word, cutting images, cutting film, um, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And speaking of breaking down narratives, that's such a favorite with us, as you know. Uh, I also uh, finished uh, earlier this year uh, my second novel, which is called The Devil's Footprint. And that novel is coming out in about a week from today. It's coming out on Halloween. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting story. I've greatly enjoyed uh, writing this book about the, the Devil's Footprint. And it's about this uh, classical dichotomy, this dualistic relationship that has uh, so imbued the Western culture since uh, a long time, namely between God and Satan. And these uh, characters are, in, in my book, uh, intertwined and working uh, together, but also against each other in very devious ways. It's about um, how strange our contemporary times are. There are simply so many problems, and those problems make they all make God very, very tired. And he, has, uh, he admits to Satan that he suffers from something called 
humanitis and it's a it's a disease or an affliction that we i think we can all relate to <laughs> i suffer from humanitis too by the way uh, but the thing is god is so tired so he feels he must you know call satan uh, back up to his uh, celestial realm and offer him a seat or a throne whatever it's called um and have his status as an archangel back if he helps out with this incredible mess that the humans have made on the planet that's an interesting um, challenge for satan who accepts and the book is about what happens when um, satan puts everything back in order again it's uh, fun. <laughs> it's really good. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And then along the way, as uh, Satan and his team apocalypse, uh, you know, make everything right again, he starts becoming a little bit uh, hesitant about uh, this offer. You know, can you really trust God? Can you really tr trust these archangels? Uh, I'm not going to give away anything more than that. You'll have to read the book. But it's a fun read. I think that people will love this book. Actually, I hope so. Uh, I've greatly enjoyed writing it. It's called The Devil's Footprint and it will be out uh, on the usual online booksellers uh, from Halloween and onwards. The Devil's Footprint. It's something to read in this beautiful autumn darkness. It's perfect for our times. <laughs> yeah. It's a perfect uh, antidote for the times we're living in. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit of an antidepressant actually. It's yeah. just a, a jolt of fun. Um, speaking of devils, which we do frequently, uh, <laughs> there's also the film, of course, I think, I hope that most of you have seen my documentary, Anton LaVey, Into the Devil's Den, um, which has been um, very well received. I'm happy to say it's been sc screening and streaming and whatever they call it uh, in many places. And I've turned this project now also into a book. Uh, that's a book that's coming out next year. Um, and um, we will return to that as the project develops. But it's a vastly expanded um, book if you compare with the film. When you make a film, it's a bit problematic because you have to fit the film format and the film can't be like 16 hours long. Well, it can, but it will have uh, considerably less viewers then. So, of course, when you edit a film, you have to take these things into consideration. But then again, you know that you have so much material left you know, you want to have everybody uh, full say and uh, let them, uh, you know, uh, tell their stories. So that's basically what I've done with the book version that's coming out next year. Um, and again, we'll keep you informed. But I just wanted to mention it because of the devil aspect and the fact that it's another book that's uh, wrapped up mm -hmm. during this uh, strange summer. Yes, yeah, so that'll be out next year with inner traditions yes exactly exactly well you know we work on books vanessa works on her books i work on my books but we also work on books together um again um, when we, we talked before about this uh, method of cooperation and breaking down narratives and some of you know our patrons know for sure that we have been working on a novel together it's called the exquisite corpse and it's in part thematic, it's about what the book is about, but it also the method where, you know, I write a chapter, then Vanessa writes a chapter, and so on and so forth. And now we're up to, I think, chapter 12 or something like that. And it's really interesting to see how something that was, in my mind, conceived of as a... Uh, sort of Scandi noir uh, thriller or detective story has now grown into something completely different. It is, yet it's become something else. Um, and um, we really love this process and it's a great, great, great uh, read uh, from what we hear from our patrons. So uh, if you want to check out the development, the continual development of The Exquisite Corpse, we publish one chapter every, it's called, was it bi-monthly, every full moon, every new moon. Uh, we publish a new chapter so it's like an ongoing uh, series uh, in this growth of this new uh, novel by, yeah. by us both yeah it's for our ten dollars and that patrons every other week and when we started the book um we both wrote our first chapter separately without knowing what the other one wrote um so carl started out as kind of this scandinavian noir detective novel um 
which makes sense. And I decided to kind of integrate these magical aspects with some of our creative and magical friends. Um, and this time that we spent in Jijuca in the, in the mountains of Morocco last summer. And so it's come together between these two kind of poles to see how um, these different characters are fitting together into one story. And it's really been fun. It's my first time writing fiction. Um, and I've also been integrating some cut-ups into it where um, kind of my main character falls into these kind of dream spells. Um, so it's been really fun, and you should definitely check it out. Join mm. us at Patreon. That's right. Um, and again, uh, in terms of corporations, um, I think the, the most recent um, cut-up poetry recording, music, film, art show thing we did was uh, Mementeros. And I would certainly like to bring that to the surface again, because I really love that film, album, <laughs> Uh, the cut-ups for it. And Mementeros is uh, uh, focusing on sort of more erotic stuff, uh, erotic texts that we cut up and wrote and cut up again. And Vanessa uh, recorded them, reading her, you know, herself reading them. And I put them to music and then we made a film together. And at the same time, uh, we took screenshots from the film and made collages on top. Uh, so it's like this, again, almost never-ending cycle of refinement. Uh, and Mementeros is uh, um, uh, one of my pet darling uh, projects so far. So I think we should have a look at the uh, trailer for it. <laughs> Time, in perfect disorder. Who are you? What on earth are you doing here? I suspect the biggest thrill is anthropological after all. Great, so that was the trailer for Mementeros. Uh, you can watch the film on the Vimeo On Demand, which we'll link to. Um, and also the collages that were shown as an art exhibition at the uh, Museum of Pornography and Art in Zurich last summer um, are all for sale on the Tripart website. And again, those are also on sale. Prices are slashed because we've just downsized the Trapar warehouse, so we're just getting rid of things. Yes. So it's a really good time to go wild in Trapar if you've been wanting to, because everything is like completely slashed price-wise. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. And um, now we have been talking and talking about uh, ourselves. Ourselves. So, yeah, our favorite subject <laughs> uh, uh, for a long time. But again this TV show wouldn't be what it is unless we talked about the stuff that uh, our many, many friends out there have sent in. And we, of course, are going to continue with that. And uh, one of the books that have come in uh, is from our friend Adele Suto in uh, Florida. Uh, and uh, his work is always amazing. It's like an old DIY aesthetic, but there's also um, he's a great photographer and just a really a great artist. And this, this, his most recent book is called uh, Ad Removal as Modern Art. So good. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. And it's basically Adele uh, walking around with his camera and taking pictures of um, walls, like ad spaces where uh, uh, huge ads have been torn, uh, pay, you know, glued over or torn down or sprayed upon. And it's just and this great this off. Yeah, it's just scrape offs. And it just creates this fantastic um, abstract art without any, you know, mental constructions or, or explanations or, uh, you know, examinations of any kind of structures. It's just beautiful stuff straight out of reality. Uh, and I'm, you know, when I saw this book, it's like, it's 
it's fantastic but it also it's, it's a tradition in a way I'm um, thinking of uh, the great American very influential photographer Walker Evans who shot some really wonderful st stuff back in the 30s already of this great American language the uh, the language of advertising that can become so uh, distorted and in a way cut up when it's torn down <laughs> it's the american psychology in a nutshell <laughs> um and and then also rebuilt with you know place a new ad on top and hoping that the, the what's behind or beneath should just go away uh but no there are people you know the, tearing at them and, and adding to them and painting them and it's just fantastic so this this book ad removal as modern art it truly is what what the title says it's a fantastic book and it is modern art at its very very finest i would say because it has no superstructure has no intellectual uh, justification or explanation it's just very very beautiful images out of reality reality and the only aesthetic aspect of it is that it's a momentary filtering through Adele's camera and he has a very keen and good eye so we would strongly recommend Adele's art in general of course but this book uh, in particular right now it's fantastic it's really really good yeah we've talked about Adele before because we love everything he does he's fantastic um, and he's also a musician and his group is called 156 so if you look on Bandcamp it's spelled out 156 um, so definitely check that out as well and then another artist, musician that we absolutely adore is our friend B, uh, Paul B. Hampshire. Um, and B has just come out with this new Thai capsule project that he's been working on for a really long time. We mentioned it in the beginning of the summer and now it's really coming to fruition and becoming available. Um, so let's check out the trailer for the Thai capsule. Hissing and screeching like a sack of cats, a bunch of cackling girls and speed queens hover over a cute Cambodian motorcyclist. Hey, first star on the right and straight on till morning. Fire in his eyes, blood gasping, death orgasm. Satanic black hair, acid. Shakes and shudders, time, death, death, death. You wake up at the side of the room. Faint smells, gasoline. Khartoum Vision. There's an old Indian shrine hidden away in the back streets of Bangkok's garment district. The E on the entrance sign has been tampered with, so now it reads in trance. A life-size statue of a young Indian girl. Her name is Khartoum Vision. The key that unlocks the age-old question. 
How will death finally take me? The scene jerks and shifts into fast forward mode. George, who's now at death's door, stumbles into the shrine. A car steering wheel lodged in his chest spits out bits of broken teeth and dashboard. I want my fucking gold back! Fantastic. Yeah, B is a genius. Make no mistake. Yeah, his aesthetic is so incredible. Um, we have a kind of premier preliminary version of the Thai capsule ourselves, and what you don't get out of the film is how incredible it smells. <laughs> so <laughs> when you open the box, it's just like mm, it totally immerses all of your senses, and that's really fantastic, fantastic art. And another thing we should mention is that uh, Deus Records is putting out um, one of B's records right now, so you should just check that out as well. Yep, indeed. And the biscuit. B's also in the yeah, biscuit. Yeah, that's right. As that's am right. I. <laughs> um, the biscuit is a new zine that is created from Three Bones Society. Um, the editor and the founder is Eric Lerner. And B has a piece in here. Um, the title of this biscuit, volume one, issue one, is called Thus Spake Zarathustra, a book for all and none. And so we were all given the task of writing something um, inspired by Nietzsche. And Charlotte Rogers is in here, who of course is one of our favorite artists. We have all of her work behind us all of the time in this show. Katie Bohens has a poem in here. Um, Katie was a speaker at both of our conferences, and she also has a book out on Scarlet Imprint uh, called Trinity Star Trinity, which I'll link to in the text. Um, of course, Eric Lerner, Ron Athey's work is in here. Of course, a longtime performance artist, um, Thomas Vandekrat, and B, and of course, Vanessa. Repetition yeah. in Friedrich Nietzsche. I have a little essay and some uh, cut ups in here, cut up collages. Um, and our friend Dolorosa's in here as well. Um, yeah, so there are, yeah, this is a star studded zine for sure, and a great first volume of this new project, The Biscuit. Mm -hmm. Check it out at threebonesociety.com. And then another friend that I'll mention is a really old friend of mine named Carlos Estrada from high school, actually. And he's been doing really amazing uh, musical work as well. So I wanted to show a video um, from his musical project, The Siamese Pearl. This is called Love Clots, Angel Candy. Thank you. 
great. So that was fantastic. And the video itself was created by another old friend, also from Miami, named Richard Verges. And Richard is a collage artist in his own right. Um, you should follow him on Instagram at Dick Verges. And he also is the person who runs this publishing company, uh, Noir Age Publishing, which has been putting out the Siamese Pearls albums. Um, and there's a host of other musicians and musical projects on, well, on there as well. So check out Noir Age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's no, great stuff. Um, all of these things that are uh, popping up and that people are sending us this is a very, very interesting. There's uh, it's not a return. It's a moving onwards in this fanzine aesthetic. And now we can do very many things uh, quite easily with like print on demand and uh, or older school. Uh, things like Xeroxing. Anyway, the, the fanzine aesthetic is direct and it's tactile. We of course love it very much and we're very happy that people are working with this. Um, and it can be like, you know, the biscuit that Vanessa just talked about, which is like in, in color and well printed and it's just fantastic. And Or Hellebore that we've talked about before too. It's just this very wonderful esprit of having something tactile yet very independently made. And one of the things that we received recently also is very, very interesting, small, also in the poetry vein, it's a very small little zine, um, wonderfully titled Blood, Come and Spit. And it comes in, it looks like this, and it comes in many different sh colors. <laughs> and it's just wonderful because of the um, simplicity of it. It's tactile, it's very simple, and it's just, um, a folded sheet basically that looks like a little pamphlet and it contains um, poetry of a most uh, magical kind and as the title uh, signifies blood come and spit we go back to uh, topi territory to a topi mind frame the temple of psychic youth and their ritualizing uh, of course very near and dear to my heart and other parts of my body uh, but the thing is um, why we love uh, initiatives like this is like when you have a need uh, for you have to express something and you want to share it the internet is great in all, all its intangible glory but it also kind of evanescent in that so many things fall through um, the net <laughs> if you pardon the pun uh, but when you make something tactile it's it is what it is. You can't escape it. And that's exactly the point. You want people to be able to touch it, read it, perhaps even smell it and keep it a little um, catalog or a little archive of simply cool stuff that's inspiring for you. And that's why we want to recommend people checking out. We'll again link to this Blood Come and Spit and all the other beautiful fan scenes that people are doing because it's so much more than uh, making a book and making it available through a publisher. It's a labor of love. And that's what you can uh, transmit or, or um, uh, show in a much easier way when you have tangible products. Um, the process is truly in the product. Um, so again, I recommend it, Blood Come and Spit. You can't get better than that. And there are many issues. I think there's just a new issue out now too. Yeah, and another person uh, out of France, Hector Domain, who's been putting together his own zine called Eros Mechanique. Um, this is a fantastic artist that I learned about on Twitter, I believe. Uh, he's also on Instagram, and he's been making these zines just starting this year, and he's already made four of them. Um, clearly a passion project, yes. something that he really <laughs> loves. Um, and the latest one, number four, is all about um, tattooed ladies. But he's got this really great aesthetic, this beautiful vintage uh, style, but with modern um, photographers and models. And also he draws on them a lot of the time. So he'll draw on images of models that he likes and kind of enhance certain parts of them. Um, and it's very uh, Pierre Molinier, uh, definitely influenced by P Pierre Molinier, I'm sure, who is a master at this yeah. um, and who I wrote about in my book, uh, Scansion and Psychoanalysis in Art. And yeah, I really, really recommend 
uh, checking out Hector Domain's work. We've even gotten a couple original pieces from him. Yeah. And he also has prints of his work uh, for sale on his site at a really reasonable price, including this fantastic one that goes along with the newest issue of this Alice in Wonderland theme tattoos. Will you, won't you? Will you join me? Will you join the dance? Mm-hmm. Very yeah. enticing. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's fantastic stuff. And also it's really well produced. Uh, again, it's sort of a DIY fashion, but you can do uh, such a uh, great many things still within uh, under an DIY umbrella. And Hector is a good example of that. Yeah, and then he's also made his first book, which is called The Adventures of Mademoiselle Rose, um, which is also a very titillating book, as you can see. Um, it has his illustrations um, and his very uh, Pauline Réage mm-hmm. feeling, <laughs> if you like the story of O. Um, so this is also a fantastic piece to pick up. I'm not sure if this is still in print. I know the first edition sold out quickly, and I think the second edition might have sold out too. But he seems to be um, reproducing new editions when they do sell out. So definitely check out The Adventures of Madame Cell Rose as well. Mm-hmm. And since we're mentioning zines and these kind of DIY <coughs> projects, we should also mention that that's our next Patreon goal. Um, 23rd Mind TV exists because we said when we reached a certain amount that we would start producing 23rd Mind TV and and, and showcasing all these fabulous projects. And the next thing that we're going to do when we reach 69 patrons is um, we're going to start our own zine, which we'll put together uh, everybody's work together in a zine and print that. So... Yeah, exactly. Bring bring in, bring on more patrons, and we'll soon have a twenty uh, third mind zine. fanzine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Filled with good stuff. Yeah, yeah. I guess that wraps it up for this time. We we still have a lot of things to talk about in terms of what people have sent us, but we're gonna resume in the next. Uh, episode of 23rd Mind TV, so you have to be patient. In the meantime, uh, check out all the links, check out all the people who have supported us, and please uh, join us at our Patreon, and um, stay safe, stay healthy, all these things. And um, The we- last thing I'll mention is my dress, Marshmallow by Lady. Fabulous. Also check them out. That's right. We like to endorse good things. <laughs> okay, take care everybody, and thank you very much. See you soon. Bye.